Good afternoon. I want you to focus on two simple equations. Global climate change equals extreme weather events. Extreme weather events equal devastation. Thank you for joining us for the CNBC Africa debate responding to extreme environmental risks. I'm joined to deep dive into the conversation by Al Gore, Vice President of the United States 1993 to 2001, Chairman and Co-Founder, Generation Investment Management, and a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. Peter O'Neill, Prime Minister, Papua New Guinea. Hindu, Omaru Ibrahim, who is the coordinator of the Association for Indigenous Women and People of Chad, and Philip Hillebrand, who is Vice Chairman of BlackRock. Thank you all for joining me. Vice President Gore, can you tell me why we need to care more about climate change today than ever before? Well, I think Mother Nature is making that pretty clear. Every night on the news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. Uh, we are trapping enough extra heat in the Earth's system because of man-made global warming pollution to equal the energy that would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours. It's a big planet, but that's a lot of energy. And one consequence that has a direct impact on extreme weather events is that all this extra heat energy is disrupting the water cycle by evaporating much more water vapor off the oceans, which falls in much larger downpours when it reaches the land. So we get these massive uh, rain bombs that have become so commonplace, and that results in floods and mudslides. 500 people died in Sierra Leone earlier this year from mudslides, uh, similar events uh, occur regularly around the world now. Uh, the same extra heat also pulls moisture out of the soil, which makes the droughts deeper and longer and has a profound effect on agriculture. Uh, so we get stronger storms. Because most of the heat goes into the oceans, the storms that come over the oceans as cyclonic storms, uh, cyclones, hurricanes, typhoons, become much more uh, devastating. Just this year, this past year in Houston, Texas, we got one and a half meters of rain from one hurricane, and we had several more besides that. So these events are, are getting worse. They were predicted to, to, to get uh, this extreme and intense by scientists years ago. And because their predictions have come true, we should pay careful attention to what they are telling us now about what will happen in the future and how we can moderate this destruction in the future by stopping the practice of using the Earth's atmosphere as an open sewer. So I don't want to dramatize the situation, but if we don't act quickly, how much time do we have left? Well, the consequences that we're already experience, experiencing will continue for some time and will get worse, but we still have the ability to make changes by not dumping 110 million tons of man-made heat-trapping pollution into the atmosphere every day. Uh, if we did not, then the consequences would be uh, horrific and would pose an existential threat to the survival of human civilization. Mr. Prime Minister, let's go to Papua New Guinea and the fact that El Nino 2015-2016 impacted your island nation, both droughts and also with frost. Take us back to that time, because I want to bring this conversation to ground level. Tell me how Papua New Guinea experienced this extreme weather environment. Uh, it certainly was over a long eight months of uh, uh, drought without any drop of rain uh, in, in my country. We are a small uh, Pacific Island nation right in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, so you, you, it affects uh, quite a large number of communities where they live on farming and as a result of no rain, there is nothing growing. And you have to slash budgets to try and feed your population. Uh, and it is an enormous uh, challenge to many families. Uh, fortunately, we were able to feed ourselves by 
uh, direct government interventions into, into uh, providing food supplies to families on a daily basis. But this is happening right across, uh, not only in Papua New Guinea, but right, right across many African, Caribbean, and Pacific Island nations. Uh, to no fault of theirs, they are made to suffer with these extreme weather conditions that they are facing. A uh, high number of uh, uh, tropical storm that is now starting to happen on a frequent basis, getting stronger and more destructive, uh, and many communities and families being misplaced. Uh, this is a serious issue while the rest of the world has started continuously debating about whether uh, climate change is real or not. It is certainly affecting uh, smaller countries and communities. Uh, we have to realize that uh, in, in our generation, uh, there will be few countries who will no longer exist as countries uh, uh, in, in, our, in our world. They will have to relocate if we do not attend to the uh, issues that are on hand. So, uh, uh, it is a great we'll challenge. See displacement and further migration, widespread migration, climate forced refugees. climate refugees. Yeah. Hindu, Chad, Prime Minister brought us or brought Africa into the conversation. Talk to me about the people on the ground and how local people have been impacted by extreme weather events in your country. Well, coming from a country like Chad, who is a Sahelian country, is in uh, uh, much locked and vulnerable about the climate change. Uh, I think the impact are real on the weather change. Firstly, we used to have like a dry season followed by rain season and followed by cold season. Of course, it's not cold like Davos, but uh, it's uh, cold in our time. So those rain season become much shorter. The place where it used to be six months, now it's between three to two months. And everybody know that rain, it's impacting crops, and crops is the food security. And then now we are facing the food security around all the Sahel regions, and especially in Chad, the regions who are not impacted. Let me give you the concrete examples. The climate change impact directly water. And the famous example that I'm using is the Lake Chad. Of course, Lake Chad is very dramatic from the uh, uh, 25,000 kilometers squares, just so we run to 150. 90% of the waters evaporated, not used by industrialized agriculture or something, just evaporated. And then... So 90% of the water mm. in Lake Chad is evaporating? Evaporated on only 40 years. So it's uh, not like... Uh, a, 100 years, or we can project only 40 years, 90% evaporated. And then you have population growing up. So more than 30 million people living around. And the consequence is conflict between communities. Mm. We are talking about the international conflict that Boko Haram, the famous one. But how about the local and regional conflict between farmers, fishermen, pastoralists, mm. who are competing on the natural resources access. Mm. So people are dying, not just by, by pleasure, because they just want to get a food. They just want to get survival. And then that brought me to what uh, both uh, uh, Premier Minister and Vice President said about migration. So of course, migration is very sad for the European people's developed countries that saying, oh, we are having the problem, people are coming. But how about the internal Migration. I want to come back to climate refugees because Vice President Gore firmly put it on the table and it will be a discussion point sure. in the next hour. Philip, I want to bring you in and I want to just tone it down a little bit in terms of the drama that I have started with and take you back to Sunday when you arrived in Davos and give me a sense of how you felt. What happened? Well, I've, I've lived and come up here, you know, my whole life and uh, we put our two-year-old daughters to bed, and next thing we knew, somebody knocked on the door, two gentlemen in uniforms and walkie-talkies, and told us that the cots were ready at the local gymnasium, and we would very likely have to get evacuated okay. during the middle of the night. So this is, this is real. Um, you know, it's in Davos. We have a lot of mountainous regions in Switzerland. Mudslides are at an all-time high. Uh, valleys are closed off. Zermatt has been closed off, as you've seen. You couldn't get in and out. So I think the effects are real, and um, they really touch us all. And clearly, there's no escaping, even in the developed world, as the Vice President and all of you have 
have indicated. So I think it's time that we recognize, um, the corporations recognize, this can no longer be ignored. And unfortunately, we've wasted precious time, as the vice president indicated early on. Vice President Gore, mm. let's look at the world order right now. Mm. China is reviewing its environmental policies and being aggressively green and trying to redress a number of the environmental issues of the past. On the other hand, the United States is cancelling its policies where the environment is concerned. Mm. Well, what does this mean? Um, just to clarify that last point, President Trump made a speech. Yes, he'll make another one here Friday. But legally, the United States cannot withdraw from the Paris Agreement until the first day after the next presidential election in 2020. We're still in the Paris Agreement, along with every other nation in the world. So you're saying the U.S. has to participate? Well, the U.S. is legally, legally bound um, uh, until there's a notice period. And in any case, he cannot withdraw until uh, 20, the end of 2020. And if there's a new president, uh, excuse me for a moment, uh, then uh, a new president could uh, just give 30 days notice and the U.S. would be back in. But here's another point to, to uh, emphasize. Our largest states like California and New York and many others and hundreds of cities and thousands of businesses uh, that, and BlackRock has been uh, one of the leaders on this uh, ha are still committed to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and, because of, and because of that, uh, the estimates now are pretty clear that the U.S. will comply, not only meet the uh, commitments under Paris, but will exceed them. So... Um, so really one man trying to cancel the agreements. Uh, he can do damage and will slow down the necessary progress, but we are going to exceed our commitments under the Paris Agreement in spite of what he says or tweets or, or does. Prime Minister, if you look at this world order, what are, what are your thoughts on the changing dynamics? Well, it was good to see that the uh, global community came together in Paris to uh, finalize that agreement. But unfortunately, uh, it was towards the end of the Obama administration when the United States really uh, put up its hand to take this challenge head on. And of course, convincing China to come on board. Uh, the world seems to think that uh, they've got time on hand. Uh, they forget to realize that there are real communities out there who are suffering as a result of this change in weather conditions. And we've heard uh, very clearly from Hindu and, and what is happening in Chad. And, and it affects the most poorest first. Mm. Uh, and, and, and those who cannot speak. Uh, and this is the unfortunate uh, thing about uh, uh, climate change, uh, that the, the most exposed are the, the countries with the smallest population, smallest budgets, yes. uh, and the poorest families. So I think the, the world should stand up and listen to people like the Vice President Al Gore and others who are at the forefront of our, our conversation on climate challenges. Uh, but we're running out of time to listen. I think this is the point. We actually have to turn into collaborative action globally. Right. Hindu, let's stay with this policy element for a moment. What would you want to see from your leaders? I mean, you've put some very scary stats on the table, notably that Lake Chad has been evaporating at a rapid rate, and you quoted four years. Four years. I mean, this is the short term. This is not a medium term problem. I think she this said is 40. Today. Did she say 40? 40, 40 years. Oh, I'm so glad. Because I really did think it was four years, and I really thought the end of the world was upon us still right now. Still, <laughs> a still a disaster. Still a disaster. Look, 40 years, and I'm not making light of it, is still a disaster. I should have actually clarified, because I did find it an outstanding stat. In the well, let, let, me, let me interject something, yes. if I could. I'll give you an even shorter term. 78 days from now, Cape Town is due to become the first major city in the world to completely run out of water. Yeah. Day zero. Day zero. They just moved up the date yesterday to April 12th. Uh, and the drought, the climate-related drought in the Western Cape is similar to the drought in, in the Sahel, in the Eastern Mediterranean that led to the crisis in Syria that contributed to the civil war and the outflow of climate refugees there. So there are short terms involved, but this has been a continuing process for, for some time now. And, and I want to reemphasize, it is getting worse. We still have the ability to take back control of our destiny as a species 
but we do not have time to waste. We need to get moving on it. Hindu, coming back to you, what do you want your leaders, what action do you need to see from the political leadership in Chad to remedy the situation for the local population? I think I'm coming back to the Paris Agreement first because this is the one agreement who brought all the world leaders together. And this is the agreement who gives hope to the peoples like me and my people back home. Because this agreement for the first time have the human right, equity, justice, solutions to all peoples. The Paris Accord. The, pa the Paris Agreements. And this agreement is signed by Chad and with all the ambitions. And then Chad also engaged to make actions. But the actions that people are talking about at the global level cannot impact the local peoples. We need urgent action decentralized to the local peoples. Let me give you one example again. We do have technology that everybody are proud. We are moving forward. But those local peoples cannot use those technology. But they have them technology who are calling traditional knowledge. And this is recognized also under the Paris Agreement. So these knowledges, we need to keep them. We need to reinforce them, to transfer them. Because Give me an example of the traditional knowledge. So one of the simple examples, I think everyone see the sky and they are stars. There are millions and billions of stars. So in my communities, the community leaders know exactly 28 stars. Each of the stars stay 13 days and another one come up. Only one of them stay 14 days. When you take a, just a quick calculation, 28 times 13 plus one, it's 365. Mm. We don't need January, February to get ending two months. Mm. And those stars are helping us to plant the crops, mm. to move from one place to another one. If one of them missed, so there is problem. So this is just like the general one. But there are knowledges through the weather observation that so hence, plant. you spoke about earlier the rainy season, the dry season, and the exactly. cold season, not quite as cold as Davos, you made the point. So local knowledge, traditional knowledge, technology. I think Hindus put a very, very solid uh, solution on the table for us. And we now talk to the biggest asset management firm in the world. You've got about $5.7 billion according, well, that was at July 2017, the latest stat that I saw, so correct me if I'm wrong. You've got, you've got might. You've got credo in financial circles. Larry Fink, your CEO, has come out very openly. He's written a letter to all shareholders. He has said we need a revolution in ESG, environment, social, and governance. Are we now going to see, and Pre uh, Vice President Gore has said that BlackRock is very involved in this environment. So mm. I'm gonna ask you to do even more. And what is that gonna be? Yeah, look, I think there's a, I believe I'm optimistic on there being a sea change in the way corporations look at this. For a couple of reasons, I would mention three. First of all, we're about to see the largest wealth transfer in the history of humanity. Um, we've generated enormous wealth and it's about to be passed on to the next generation. This is a, in many ways, a historic event, both in size, but also in the sensitivities of the new generation. Um, it's pretty clear to me when I look at our clients that there's something happening here that has to do with this generational sort of transfer, that you have a new generation of clients who care, who simply care more about these issues, who are attuned, who have read the vice president's books and grew up with this and, and want to see us as an asset manager to somehow respond to this, provide them with certain solutions. The second point is, or the second development is, People are beginning to realize this problem is too big for governments alone to solve. You know, I'm not the scientist, um, but other people have looked at these numbers. The World Bank estimates that 57 trillion, that's about almost three times the size of US GDP, is affected or is at risk from only extreme climate events. So we're not talking about the longer term development. Uh, these things, these numbers are enormous. They are simply too big to sort of just delegate this to government. And the third point I would say is what we have seen in politics recently, and this is not something that is just a phenomenon in the US. We've seen it in many ways across the world, that there's a sense amongst voters 
that governments have sort of failed to come up uh, on a number of fronts, environment, society, uh, governance issues, to come up with the right answers. So you take all these three things together, and I think what you see is that essentially corporations have to become part of this solution. Um, so, you know, what so are Larry you has... saying? are you saying that companies, that business, the private sector is going to lead the charge because government has failed? I, I wouldn't put it that way. I would say the private sector is recognizing that it has to become part of the solution. I don't think you can replace government. You know, I'm a firm believer that there are many things the private sector cannot and will not do. So what we need to find is ways to bring the private sector and the public sector together and address some of these issues, and this probably being, in many ways, um, the most urgent one. And, and, and I think there is something happening. There's one other point I'd want to make here. There is increasingly research, and uh, investment funds have done some of this. Harvard has done a lot of it. This research is in early days. I would call on academics to pursue this agenda. But the research is beginning to show that at a minimum, it is not clear that there's a negative trade-off from an investment perspective when you start to incorporate uh, environmental, societal, and governance factors into your investment products and offerings. And that's a breakthrough. If we can demonstrate that at a minimum, there's no negative trade-off, and potentially, if you look at it on a risk-adjusted basis, longer term, that you may actually get better financial performance. And so Larry, in his letter, talked about sustained financial performance. Let's think about financial performance in the longer term. And I'm optimistic that as we push this research agenda, and again here, I think the private sector has a role, academia has a role, government has a role, we will hopefully demonstrate that at a minimum, there is not a negative trade-off, and there may even be better performance Can I interject? results. So the research agenda, how long is this going to... I mean, hasn't the research been done, Vice President Gore? Well, uh, this particular field of research is still evolving, but I think the, the best evidence now indicates uh, what Philip was just saying. In 26 sectors uh, of the economy, the vast majority of them, the companies that, that uh, integrate ESG, environments, uh, uh, um, social, and, social and, and governance, into their business plans perform better. So you know the phrase, uh, uh, fiduciary duty, we, of course you do, but and your audience does. For many years, uh, investors uh, and asset managers have sometimes said, well, I would like to invest with attention to these things, but my fiduciary duty to my clients keeps me from doing it. The revolutionary change that Philip is getting at is, now it may be becoming clear that if you do not integrate these factors into your investing, you're violating your fiduciary responsibility. So I want to come back to, to Philip here while we're on this point. Does that mean that in your investment strategies, you are not going to invest in companies who do not put forward appropriate environmental, social, and governance me mechanisms? That's the kind of radical question. You know, at the moment, we have a fiduciary duty, which is still actually narrowly defined um, in the US, at least. So if we manage any pension funds, any U.S. pension funds, as you know, Vice President, we're fairly constrained by this fiduciary duty definition. I think it will evolve. It is evolving, exactly as you said. I think it's a step-by-step -step process. First of all, you begin to reveal to our clients what companies that they invest in do and what they don't do. That's the first step. So you start to get disclosure, transparency, We've seen efforts now around the Disclosure Task Force that is very much pushing this. Mark Carney has been at the forefront of this effort. Secondly, we are pushed, and I can tell you this is for real. Our clients are demanding products and offerings that incorporate climate change, societal issues, um, but... diversity. And we're responding to this. We, are, we just set up a whole new sustainability uh, investment department. We've hired, we announced two days ago, we have a new CIO who's going to focus uh, exclusively on this. So you're still leading the charge on that. Prime Minister, I'm going to come back to you. Hindu, you want to come in here. Just on this one, I'm so sorry. Like, we cannot accept that the investment who do not respect environment and social aspect. Because uh, what are we waiting? People are dying already. And are we continuously, like, uh, just uh, putting money in this environmental 
crisis who are killing people. I think it has to be very radical and it has to be now. Any investment fund have to require the environment safeguard, the social safeguard in order to save life, not putting money first, but life of And Hindu, if I can jump in here, and, and Philip, I will give you a right yeah. to, to respond. We're hearing the urgency from the people on the ground, and that is what we need to bring into the forum in Davos. This is not about a theoretical debate. This is about people dying, as Hindu set out earlier in the conversation. Philip. Yes, look, we could always do more. Um, this, we still don't know a lot. I mean, investors still, in many, this is why we, Mark Carney's effort was so important. They need to understand, we need to have disclosure, we need to have transparencies, what companies are actually doing. I would be very reluctant to just rush to judgment and say, you're a bad company, you're a good company. You know, this is very tricky business. We, I agree there's a sense of urgency, but we have to do this properly. And it has, to be, it has to be a mixture of us taking the lead, but we also have a duty to be there for our clients. And that's why I think the point, the first point that I made is so important. You know, at the same time, the work that the vice president and others have done for many years, now decades, is beginning to change the client preference. And that's, I think, a huge, huge factor that will move things very quickly. And I, I believe we're about to see a sort of J-curve effect in terms of sensitivity around this. Larry mentioned well, uh, his letter. I, yes. We're going to have our license to operate withdrawn if you're a company that doesn't pay attention to these things. Uh, this is, I think, a, a new development. It is, and we congratulate you for it, sir. Mr. Prime Minister, what do you want to see from... This is, this is a big question. From the developed world, in terms of help to developing nations, because ultimately, developing nations are not responsible for climate change. Well, that is true in a sense, but uh, you know, there are some developing nations like China, who, who is certainly one of the biggest contributors to this challenge. But we uh, know that, that they are trying to remedy the situation. Yes, and, and of course, we commend them for the efforts that they are making. But it, you know, I agree with Philip in a sense that it doesn't, uh, the government does not have all the solutions, all the governments do not have all the solutions to the challenges that we have. But it requires the society to change their behavior in a sense, particularly, I'll give you an example, like consumers. Like in developed economies, you have a choice. Like if you're going to buy energy, you buy uh, from a provider that is providing you clean energy. You can, you can, you can have a selection of how you contribute individually. Uh, to, to this, uh, this issue of, uh, of climate change uh, in, in global environment. And, the, and of course, uh, uh, going further than that, uh, governments need to set up policies uh, to, to make sure that they have private sector behaving in a manner that is socially responsible, environmentally friendly, and, 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 and of course, promotes good governance. And governments can do more by establishing the right policies and introducing the right legislation but we have made a great start with the Paris Agreement. It needs all of us to rectify that and, and, and parliaments to rectify that. Uh, and, and we all can move forward and live uh, within the targets that we have set. Well, we're igniting a debate. There's a lot of interactivity from the audience. And that is why I keep referring to the iPad <coughs> on a regular basis. Uh, we will be addressing these questions in the session. I do, however, just want to come back to the consumer because I hosted the Strategic Outlook Energy Systems yesterday, and the consumer was at the center of that discussion. The consumer has power. The consumer can make the choices. And I think that this could be one of those igniting solutions, mm. the silver bullet that we all start as individuals, households start caring about the planet. They start caring about the refuse and separating the plastic and not buying plastic. I mean, it's those little things. But we've got 7 billion people, or 7.2 billion people on the planet today. By 2040, we're looking at 9 billion people. We have to sustain this planet. Is the consumer the solution? And widespread campaigns to talk to that consumer. Well, consumers can play a role, for sure. And when individuals decide to insist on the climate-friendly and envir environmental-friendly uh, alternatives, that not only helps them be a part of the solution, it sends a signal to business and to manufacturers and designers uh, uh, that there is a growing demand for these new environmentally-friendly products, goods, and services. 
And that is having, uh, a, that is making a, a difference for sure. But we can't put the burden on consumers. Consumers can play a part and are already making a difference. Governments can incentivize consumers. Gover governments can and, and businesses can uh, as well. And, and let me give you one other example of a large investor. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. They were funded 100% by revenues from oil and gas in the North Sea. They just announced that they are 100% divesting from all oil and gas assets. Now, why? One reason, maybe, is that they're concerned about contributing to this worsening climate crisis. But another reason is that two-thirds of the fossil fuel reserves that have already been discovered and marked to market on the books of sovereigns and multinational companies cannot be burned. And so you recall the subprime mortgage crisis. We now have a subprime carbon bubble because at some point, just as clever investors eventually looked beneath the top layers of these uh, products with subprime mortgages and realized that they were worthless, at some point soon, people are going to realize that two-thirds of these carbon reserves are, are, are worthless. They're not going to be put to their intended use and, and burned. So at what point does that realization take hold? I don't know, but it is wi within the time span relevant to long-term investors. Hindu, I want to come to you here because I've just realized there's a fault in my consumer solution. And that is that 1.1 billion people in the world don't have access to electricity. And it's going to be very difficult to change the behavior of consumers, specifically in Chad, who are battling to feed their families and who are using fossil fuels to fuel the fires that uh, they cook with. I mean, we know the issues of how many deaths there are related to uh, fossil fuel related um, fires in, in homes. This is a difficult, a difficult scenario. Energy, it's uh, really a big solution for all peoples, but also a big luxury for a country like mine. So like getting just the electricity, a little light that you can see someone during the night or read something, it's a big deal there because we do have the natural one. We, we do have sun and then we can develop a lot of uh, renewable energy around, but this technology we are talking about it, are not accessible to all the peoples. And then transferring the technology in what it's one issue, but how this one can domesticate like country in Chad, how the peoples can get trained and then they can be their own leader of this renewable energy to get this access, maybe access to the energy for cooking because this is the first need and then electricity maybe for TV and others is another way of accessing. And let me tell you, many of the renewable energy uh, around uh, the world are targeting the big income like big city or uh, big mega dams, but those are not adapt to our environment, then specifically in Sahel. We want to have the small project in the community level where they can get access and develop. And this investment is much sustainable for the business and for the peoples who can get at least the first right access. To so energy. private sector government, uh, Vice President Gore can come in and provide these devices, these solutions. Yeah, yeah. And, and there is, there is, there is some good news. Uh, there are a lot of companies now that are installing uh, solar in in villages and in small communities in Africa. A company like uh, Mcopa, uh, they they supply lighting, and now they've sold, I don't know, almost a hundred thousand uh, low power DC television mm -hmm. sets, completely renewable energy. And it's, uh, they have these uh, mobile phone uh, apps that uh, make the payments and they make payments uh, over time and then they own it themselves. So, but, but I do want to come in here yeah. because the, the story is fantastic from the Mkopa. I know the Mkopa in mm. Kenya very well. Mm. Um, but if you look at solar, the stat is that the prices of solar PV have come down 70% since 2010. Mm -hmm. 
And was it yesterday that President Trump said he's going to put uh, duties on renewable energies up to 30% specifically on solar? So are we saying here one step forward and 50 well, steps back? That won't, that won't affect Chad. It won't affect anybody ex except people in the, in the U.S. But, but the, the cost reduction curves for the price of solar electricity and wind electricity are really startling. Some are now predicting that before the end of this calendar year, we'll see contracts for solar electricity at or less than one, one penny, one cent per kilowatt hour. In many parts of the world, it is already well below the cost of electricity from burning coal or gas. I beg to differ, though. Okay. When you say that uh, the decision won't affect uh, Chad, mm. I say that long term, if the current status quo prevails, the biggest economy in the world is creating a trade war, potentially, mm. with renewable energy. And that, for me, is unacceptable. Well, I, I disagreed with his position, uh, but, but I think that, uh, first of all, I don't, I don't typically defend him. I will say, in, in this case, it really did not start with him. This was a trade action brought by private companies. They chose a kind of a a midpoint in the range of alternatives. Could have been handled differently, should have been handled differently. But it's not an utter uh, catastrophe. And the, the, the large uh, subsidies from China for exporting solar panels has put some other companies in the world at a disadvantage. Can't we discipline these private companies? Well, I mean, I think this is a slightly different discussion as, as you suggested. You know, I think when capital owners begin to ask questions. And I think we're at the stage. By the way, it's not a surprise that Norway has gone the furthest, as you mentioned, because they own their assets. Mm -hmm. You know, in our case, it's more complicated. We are a fiduciary on behalf of assets that are owned by our clients. So we're not the asset owner. And that's why it's not as simple for an asset manager simply to say, I'm not investing in these anymore. Particularly, a, particularly such a large asset e owner. Exactly. You, you have you have a kind of a unique position, and I do understand that. So we have to work with our clients to give them more transparency, to kind of explain to them what's happening and, and move along with them. And in many cases, they're driving us, frankly. Uh, the big asset owners, in a sense, they, for them, it's easier. They can make much more radical transitions, and that's what we've seen in the case of Norway. But I think generally we can say, as the owners of capital begin to realize that not only is this important from a societal contract perspective, but it may actually make performance better if you incorporate these things, that's when we'll begin to see capital incentivized behavior in a way that is, can give us some cause for optimism. So now, in my excitement, I have ignored the audience and I want to start looking at a couple of these questions and, and put them forward. So, Rich Fuller, pollution is now shown to be the largest cause of death, 9 million per year. How does this link with climate change considering soil and chemical pollution? Any takers? Yeah, uh, that figure is related to uh, conventional air pollution, uh, which is a co-pollutant. When you burn fossil fuels, you produce global warming pollution, the CO2. You also produce local air pollution, uh, and it's killing people all over the world. So one of the other benefits that is not put into the calculations on all these things is that we can save a lot of lives from getting, from shifting away from fossil fuels and toward renewable energy. And even using gas, natural gas, uh, with new technology. Well, Eliminating that's, that's methane leakage? That, that's, that's controversial. Is it not the, a step in the right direction? Well, I used to think so. I, I've begun to doubt that. And it's, it, it, it's a legitimate controversy. But here, here's the math. If you burn gas instead of coal, you get only 50% of the CO2. But the <laughs> methane itself, uh, each molecule is 82 times as powerful in trapping heat as CO2 over a couple of decades. And the math gets complicated after that. So if you get a leakage of only 2 or 3%, which some studies say we are now getting, there was a new study that just came out two weeks ago that seems to confirm that fracking gas and other leakage in the compression and transportation is actually responsible for the spike in methane emissions. So uh, people call it a, you know, a bridge to a renewable future. It may be a bridge to nowhere. 
And they, so you know, it, as we, you've changed your thinking, we may see widespread fuels. thinking given that you're a thought leader in this environment. Well, and do you want to come in here? Yeah, I wanted to say, like, uh, chemical pollutions on the soil is also about the uh, uh, industrialized agricultures, where the chemical can pollute the soil, degrade lands, and mm. also pollute the underground water. Mm. And this land degradation now, it's a lot around the world. And I, I think that we cannot give like a, a give a tips to the industrialized agriculture because they are feeding the world. But which kind of food that they are giving? We do have the traditional agriculture, and this family agriculture who feed millions and billions of peoples. I think that need to be take into consideration and maybe promote better in order to mitigate the chemical pollution. And this is the case of Africa. We are talking in Europe about the bio food, uh, green food, and then green agriculture. But we do have bio in Africa. This is the family agriculture that we need to promote. So we have Paula Kahumbu, who is a famous uh, National, National Geographic wildlife explorer, uh, asking a question. And she's saying, is it realistic for a proper accounting or for proper accounting to be done for all products, including long-term impacts so that consumers know and pay for the real cost. And I suppose, Philip, this comes back to the research that you were alluding to earlier. Yes, and, and you know, we need to be careful to jump to conclusions. I think the answer right now is we don't have that yet. We don't have that knowledge yet. But again, the research is moving very rapidly, I think. And, um, you know, we will hopefully, just the way in the financial crisis, everybody was focused on short-term returns. And then we realized we better think about this in risk-adjusted returns. I think we're kind of at a point where this is beginning to change in finance, that people are beginning to do a lot of research to think about what does it, what does it mean on my performance if I incorporate some of these factors. So I am optimistic. So Hindu, I just want to bring Prime Minister in at this point. But a lot of, just let me just say, a lot of work needs to be done. I would, you know, this is not, again, this is not something that can be left to governments or the private sector. Academia, I think, has a very, finance here, the academic profession of finance has an important role to play to come up and, and work on this. Because it's a critical question if, as the Vice President said, if all of a sudden you see that actually you get better performance, I would expect that you see a, you know, an acceleration of this trend that I've described. So this is a critical, a critical issue. And here's a criticism of my environment, specifically the media from Jill Caesar. So disasters in the US get excellent coverage, like the hurricanes of 2017. What is the role of the media, I suppose I should be asking myself this question, to raise awareness of disasters in Papua New Guinea? You tell me what you would like to see from the likes of us. Well, I think it's important to tell the story about the destruction that you know, climate change brings to communities. Uh, this is real and real time. It's not something that is uh, uh, going to disappear soon. Uh, and, and, and global community needs to be aware of that. As I said earlier, that. Uh, uh, out of the, I'm a chair of the, comp, uh, the uh, group called ACP, which is the uh, African, Caribbean, Pacific nations. A third of those countries uh, uh, will disappear if uh, nothing is done. Mm -hmm. uh, they will cease to exist as a, as a nation. Uh, and this is, uh, this is real, and communities will be displaced, and migration will take place. Uh, some have already been displaced because uh, some of these countries are very low-lying nations. And, and uh, their way of life has been disrupted. Could I comment yes. on that question? Mm -hmm. uh, two points. You're, you're right that uh, events in the U.S. will typically get m more coverage. The, the week that Houston had one and a half meters of rain from Hurricane Harvey, there was a lot of coverage. But that same week, one third of Bangladesh was underwater from a, a very large extra increment of downpours in the monsoon. And that did not get coverage. But here's a, another point. In the coverage of the Houston catastrophe and most other uh, climate-related extreme weather events, very rarely is the linkage to the climate crisis put forward. The news media, with some honorable exceptions, has failed badly in, in its duty to report about the reality of the climate crisis. In the U.S., we just went through the third presidential election cycle in a row, 12 years, without one single question being asked of any of the candidates in any of the debates about the climate crisis. 
In calendar year 2016, we don't have the figures for 2017 yet, the three major, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox uh, News uh, Sunday, they don't have a nightly newscast, all four of them together, 365 days. How much time did they do devote to climate? 45 minutes. 45 Thank goodness minutes. we are devo devoting 60 minutes to, yes. to <laughs> Good for CNBC. responding to extreme environmental risks on this panel. Now, here's one. I think we must poll you all on this. Anonymous. How positive are you? And I want to start uh, with you, Hindu. How positive are you? How much chance do you believe there is that we will react and in time as society to fight the climate change before it's too late. And I think it's very important to get government, to get business, and to get civil society to answer this question, Hindu. I think be, be, being positive, it's that what keep me and my peoples alive. So I think through all the Paris Agreement engagement, that's give already one step. And the second step, it's about the investment and the collaborations, like, uh, I am not sure that I, in Davos, it's happened that a person who represents indigenous peoples like me or community come and sit and then give his views. So having this collaboration and listening from peoples also give hope. But is it hope can give life? I don't think so. What we need is more action, and action like right now, and very radical action, step by step, it was 10 years ago when we had the research. We don't need research who can prove anything. The proof we have it. We have it in US, excuse me, just to come to the examples. We have the US fire, we have the US uh, inundation, we have UK inundation, we have fire in Africa in every place. Those impacts around the world are not choosing the poor. Of course, it's making the poor much poorer, but it's not choosing also the rich. So we yeah, I just want to, to refer here together. to the report that the, the World Economic Forum, the, the risk report, the global risk report, yeah. and the fact that the environmental risks have been elevated in that report. So just a follow-on question is how are you being received, given the prominence that environmental issues are getting at the forum here, how are you being received? Are you positive about the interactions that you're having? I mean, no, because people listening, but they are not listening by them, by, by them erring to act. So that's what I understand here. And this is frustrating because what I want, like by next year's Davos, to see change in at least one community around the world. And that's, I think, very far to be happen. Then I think I really beg you to come back and get the radical solutions and impose to your clients, maybe you lose them for 10 years, but you will get them back on the next 20 years if you are really confident about what you are doing. And if you do not forget- Philip, I hope that you are, you are listening <laughs> intently. I can tell you, Hindu, he's listening and it looks as though he may very well act. Yes. Let's go back to that question. Let's get business in here. How positive are you that we will react in time? Look, we, I addressed a group of chairmen yesterday. They were admittedly mostly European. Vice President, so maybe it would have been a different image. Uh, but my sense was I was prepared to, to get uh, criticized quite heavily for the letter that Larry Fink wrote and some of the things we're saying in terms of moving the agenda forward. And actually the opposite happened. Maybe it's the spirit of Davos, maybe it's the fact that they were all stuck in a snowstorm. I don't know, but I have a sense that something is moving. Uh, now, it probably will not make you happy, it won't be fast enough. But we have to be realistic. We also have an enterprise to run. We have shareholders. This is a complicated story. I think you know, nobody is served by kind of reducing this to, to um, very simple sort of fast things that we have to do immediately. We have to change capitalism. This is really what's at stake here. And frankly, um, we need a new kind of contract between companies, investors, and governments. Capital, corporations, and governments. If we don't do that, we're seeing what's happening in terms of the politics. You're a better expert at this than I am, but it seems to me that dissatisfaction has manifested itself in some, in some countries explicitly, in others it's sort of still below the surface. Uh, so we, I'm optimistic, I have to be optimistic, right? But it is, a, it is slow moving, 
Uh, I have a lot of faith in this new generation, in this wealth transfer that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and I'll and take I think the we're beginning to see it. I'll take the optimism. Prime Minister, are you going to add to that optimism? Y yes, I mean, you, you look at it now, the debates and discussions and conversations that are happening all around the world, it's encouraging. Uh, this, this, isn't, this wasn't the case a few years back. Uh, every global meeting that many of the leaders that attend, uh, uh, this conversation is part of the, becoming a central part of the conversation. Uh, uh, climate change is an issue. So I, I think and it's good to see when Philip's talking about businesses starting to take more uh, sense of uh, responsibility uh, uh, in, in our day, uh, invest in companies and, and seeing governments and consumers and just going back on what uh, Vice President Gore said earlier to see even larger funds like the Norwegian fund that uh, largely benefited out of the oil and gas business are now starting to uh, take, take uh, interest in uh, non-renewable uh, investments and you, that is encouraging to see the same change happening even in the Middle East. You look at uh, uh, UAE, the uh, non-renewable initiatives that they have taken, it's uh, uh, I think it's a step in the right direction, I think globally uh, the conversation is right. Although there is some agency, uh, but I think uh, we're heading in the right direction. Unfortunately, the technology is failing me. I am mm. going to get your level of optimism, and mm. then there's a brilliant question here that I want to use for our, our final round. Uh, I always choose optimism, and I do genuinely believe that we are going to win this struggle. But the part of the question that uh, is most important is in time. Will we win it in time? The answer to that more precisely framed question is still to be determined, and your audience can play a role in answering that question. Because pressure from the grassroots, from citizens who speak out, use their voice, use their votes, use their choices in the marketplace, can make a difference. There is a building wave, and in technology and business, it's now clear to me that we're in the early stages of a sustainability revolution that uh, is based on higher levels of efficiency, the Internet of Things, machine learning and artificial intelligence. It has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. We're learning how to manage uh, electrons, atoms and molecules with the same precision that Google and Apple manage uh, bits of information. And this is leading to a wave of hyper-efficiency and reduced emissions that is very, very encouraging. But there are still forces trying to hold the world back from the change that we must make quickly enough to avoid catastrophe. I love that. The magnitude of the industrial revolution mm. and the speed of the digital mm. revolution. And that actually comes to the question. Unfortunately, as I said, it has failed me. But if I remember correctly, it's from Michael, and he's saying... How can renewable technologies, because I want to close this on a positive note, mm. and of course we've still got another whole debate, two more days of debate here at the World Economic Forum and lots of people to convince of the story. So how can renewable technology change the game for us? You know that the term we used to use regularly, and I think it might have been banned at the World Economic Forum, is leapfrog. How can we leapfrog as a result of renewable mm. technology? Mm. Vice President? Well, just look at uh, the example of telephones in Africa. When uh, the mobile phones uh, first were introduced, suddenly there was no reason to, to put wooden poles in the ground and string copper wire across the landscape. They leapfrogged to mobile phones. And particularly in East Africa, but increasingly all over the continent, People use their phones for banking, for commerce, and you see Maasai uh, warriors uh, uh, reach into their uh, garb and pull out a mobile phone. Uh, I've seen that myself. Uh, in the same way, now that solar electricity is cheaper, I I certainly in Africa and uh, soon everywhere, now that it's cheaper than fossil fuel electricity, why would you do, put all the, that uh, electrical grid in place and buy expensive coal uh, day after day after day, pollute the air, pollute the water, pollute the ground, when you can just switch to clean, renewable solar energy? Clean, world... renewable solar energy. Yeah. Philip, I'll come back to you, sir. Mm. 
Let's get but, your addition here. Look, I think the, the key challenge is 30% of the world's energy is still met through coal. Uh, so the, the main contribution renewable energy has to make is to kind of rapidly reduce uh, that percentage. Most people don't realize how big coal still is uh, in terms of an energy source. I would also say the big problem that need, yet needs to be cracked is how you store energy. You know, despite the excitement about car batteries, we're not very good, at least that's my understanding, um, you know, at storing uh, solar energy. So if we can't figure out a way to store it, there's going to be limits to the extent that we can hope that this 30% really declines rapidly. Uh, to me, that is the, the real technological challenge is not just the renewable energy per se, but how to store it once we've produced it. You wanted to object on well, the storage well, element. Well, uh, that has been the case, but the, the cost reduction for battery storage has also been plummeting. Uh, it's come down very fast and, and continues to come down. The largest building on planet Earth is in northern Nevada. It's called the Giga Factory. It's Tesla's battery factory. They're cranking them out. There are 10 more of them in blueprint to stage right now. They just opened the largest battery in the world in South Australia, uh, and it's working wonderfully. They're buying a lot more of them. The combination of affordable battery storage and renewable electricity is going to completely transform the energy sector. One other point, we have to realize that governments around the world are still subsidizing coal, oil, and gas at a rate 38 times higher than the meager subsidies. $360 billion, the number for 2020. Well, the IMF counts it at $5.3 trillion. That includes some indirect costs, but it's 38 times larger than the subsidies for renewables. If governments would just stop forcing taxpayers to subsidize the destruction of our civilization, we'd be better off. Prime Minister, you are nodding in agreement. Yes, precisely. I think uh, as, as the cost of renewable energy uh, uh, comes down, uh, more and more consumers will opt for that. And, uh, you know, in villages around some of the remote communities in my own country, uh, they're converting into uh, uh, solar energy you know, on a very fast rate. And as uh, Vice President stated, even mobile technology is, is from almost uh, 200,000 users in the mobile network before uh, the infrastructure was made available. We have over 2 million people subscribing one year. Would you, would you go so far as to say that renewable technology is already transforming Papua New Guinea? Of course, slowly. Although the uptake is not there yet for many, many uh, number of people, but the, as the costs are coming down, more and more people are... Have you got policies that are friendly as government towards renewable energy? Well, policies including we don't uh, have tariffs on renewable energy products coming into the country. Uh, so uh, that, that subsidizes or that reduces costs dramatically. Uh, makes it available to the consumer at much lower cost. Hindu, I've been listening, and I've given you the last word. Yeah, I, I think technology revolution can help a lot to mitigate climate change. But don't forget that the natural mitigation too is around forests. Forests mm. is the huge technology naturally costing nothing and accessible to everybody who mitigate. And don't forget all technology, natural or a revolutionary modern, we need accompanied by the partnership. And partnership, it really have to be very strongly. And that I'm talking about uh, one example of the Tropical Forest Alliance, who put government, civil society, indigenous peoples, business, all together discussing about how we can use more our forests and mitigate it. This is the technology we need to take into consideration. Final words, sir. I totally agree. Just remember, the will to act is itself a renewable resource. And the message is loud and clear. If we're looking to share a future in a fractured world, then we need to move quickly to consolidate global action on climate change, or we may not have an Earth to make great again. In fact, there may be no future at all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the esteemed panelists. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.